All right, folks. I uh, just wanted to get you caught up. I know everybody's sick of winter, and uh, relatively speaking, so are we. But um, my friend Sean made this bosal for me. It's a half inch, and I really like it. And uh, the bosal, when it's when it's made correctly, you want it to kind of fit like a hat. And so there's no daylight around on this one. There's just enough room in here for my hanger. And then it lays flat against the muzzle. The drop is that is is less now. There's the drop. Okay, the collection is starting. There it is. Okay, that's with just fingering this, playing with it there. So, in other words, he's not intimidated by it, he's not threatened by it, and he's not running through it. So, I want to thank Sean because that was, it's amazing how people can do this anyway, but he did a good job. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of subjects here real quick. And uh, there's different things that keep coming up, and a lot of them have to do with tradition versus real um, things people don't have any idea about and they're curious and as you know by now we've been at this long enough where we got people that like to trail ride and some cowboys and uh, that's the perfect clientele for me that's the perfect group to watch this whatever you call that because then we don't have to deal with the riffraff so I appreciate that but something I do I tend to take my knife to everything I own and uh, a way to lock down the latigo, <laughs> if you're like me and you you choose it, is to just take your pocket knife and cut a slit in your saddle. <laughs> and what really happens is, is that I can hide this tail of this latigo now and it's again a bite. It's got a bite on it. And then I don't have anything up here. And there's nothing wrong with anywhere you want to put it. I'm just, uh, Deb's reminded me that I take a lot of things for granted. And I just, I've, I've got this on my other saddle and I really like it. So there you go. Now the, for these folks that are grazers that are really interested in the grazing, I'll show you the secret tool. Steal it from your wife. That's a meat thermometer. No, it's a bread thermometer. It's a bread thermometer. So <laughs> if you need to get bread, this is what you use. And check temperature. So I check the temperature of the ground. And if it's 47 degrees and going up, it means I'm on my way. So you have a window between 47 and 57 degrees of the earth. And you can just basically ride along, get off, stick it in the dirt. It kind of gives you an idea where you're at on your range. And uh, the other option is just pay attention. But I'm just telling you, there's a tool if you want to uh, use it. Now the latigo, the billet, the off billet, I want to show you something. Well, I don't know, it's on the other horse. Anyway, this pretty well covers what I need to talk to about this horse. But while I'm standing here, there's a deal about branding irons. And a lot of folks, Europe over here, they don't know anything about branding irons or how it works or anything. So I want to show you something. This is called an open iron. That's a CV. Okay, the reason we like open brands is because that C, all the heat is equally distributed and it's not too hot inside outside anywhere on this V the hottest point on it is the bottom of the V so if you saw my Brandon iron you would see there would be an air vent underneath that V part so that the air can get through and then you don't get a circle which is known as a blotch now a lot of people are getting creative with their brands and that's wonderful but I got to tell you these are what we call closed irons and when you make a box and you make this all one iron, it turns into what's known as a commemorative stamp. 
if you haven't made a good iron and understand what that means is every corner here is going to burn twice as hot the corner of that G is going to burn twice as hot and having the steel on the inside of this makes it burn from there out there is no problem on this side the R everywhere that there's a 90 degree turn you need to have an air vent right there 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 and so a lot of us don't prefer closed irons and especially if it's made into one iron there's nothing wrong with having two irons folks so that's my thought of the day for you is that that's open that's closed this is known as a commemorative stamp so to clarify for people who don't know what one two irons would look like you'd have a a box which you could turn into a diamond and you'd have an R right so you'd have two separate deals that you yeah put you put on. the box on if you're gonna do this then you take it off then you saunter over to the fire and get the G and then put the G on got it but personally if I had this iron I would put a box and then on the right I would put a G be a better iron well to me I just have a they're too busy they're too tight too close too hot so there's my thought of the day and that always breaks up some conversation and people explain to me how I don't know anything and that's fine. But I just wanted to share that with you. Okay folks, now we're going to talk about the missing link snaffle. And uh, there's people that... <laughs> you can say it's my horse if you want to. Okay, folks, now we're done to talk about the missing link snaffle. And uh, there's, it's, I'm tickled to death that there's been some chatter about it, meaning questions, because for a while it was just a novelty, and now people are starting to figure out how it actually works. But a question that's been brought up that I need to address is that some people are worried that it's too wide. And what my feeling is, is I want the corner of the mouth and I want to be able to have a space between the ring and the side of the mouth so you can see that space there and that's what worries people is they think it's too wide now I'm going to explain to you why I use it and why I designed it that way okay so you can watch this horse because he's not he's never had this in his mouth so it's a novelty when they first put it in but we picked him just so you could see what it looks like when you first put it in their mouth. And you'll see the sliding ring, how that works, where you can pick it up. And our friend Peyton and Jennifer in Georgia, they, they commented that they had a couple horses that were mouthy, as in, you've, we've all seen the horses, some of them that come off the track, they're real bothered, and they stick their tongue way out the side of their mouth. And it's a, it's a habit, it's a nerve thing. And they can't keep their mouth quiet. So this bit, they said, worked like a pacifier for them. And the horse's mouth got quiet. And so that's one of the reasons why the bit is what it is. The other one is, like I talked about, is that I just want it in the corner of the mouth. I don't make five wrinkles. I don't do all that. And uh, about a sliding ring, one of the advantages of it is that a horse can pick it up. Okay, so later on when I put a solid mouthpiece with a western cheek, he's already had a solid mouthpiece with a cricket in it. And when he picks it, he'll understand about picking it up like he's doing right now. But the big deal that I want to talk about today is when you can see the mouthpiece on the side of the head, that's what people are concerned about. Well, what it is, is a pre-signal. And if you'll watch that side of the skull, when I pull on the rein, the mouthpiece slides and, and makes contact. What, what I've found is that all I have to do is start to move the ring and it's got, they feel it in their mouth. You gotta understand how sensitive a horse is. So if you watch the mouthpiece move, now the ring is on touching the left side, which is how a snaffle works. And now I'll pull it the other way and the mouthpiece slides across the mouth about a quarter to a half an inch depending on the horse well that's a pre-signal right there and this way that's never too tight to bother the horse that's the way I designed it so 
you can call it a new concept if you want, but anybody that's fed with a team has seen this on their on their snaffle uh, driving horses. I notice a lot more shank bits on driving horses, which is an indicator of, I don't need to go into, but old school guys just use snaffle bits. And I noticed there was a space. And when you pull the lines, the bit would move across the mouth. And that's where I came up with this idea. So that's why you see the side of the bit. Now I want to show you something about the off latigo. People that buy our saddles on the off side, the right side of the saddle, there's a latigo that's not the type of, Deb, come over here a second. This is a regular latigo. You, you cinch them up, you pull the cinch and you go ride and you tuck it in the bell. Okay, that's fine. When I was riding colts, I always had double latigos. I had one of these on each side because in the colt world, we all know that it's a real plus to be able to adjust your saddle from either side. Well, I don't ride outside colts anymore and don't start colts, so I've got a regular billet. Okay, now you can see real easy what I'm talking about. Here's your off billet. Now when we send them to the people, it's just in with the saddle. So the way it works is you thread it onto your cinch then you put it through the top and back through your cinch. So for those of you that think it's too long, this is actually how you do it. That's the way it's designed. So I hope that covers that. Okay folks, now we're gonna do the, the rope strap. There's a million ways to put a rope on a saddle. And if, if you watch YouTube, you'll see every way they know the man. And um, they call this Oregon style. And even in the Oregon style, I've seen it wrapped different, but it doesn't matter. I'm gonna show you what we're talking about. Somebody wanted to know how long the strap was. Well, it's almost to the knee of the horse. It seems like it's, in fact, for most people, that's what they don't get about this. They're like, you don't need a strap that long. Well, I'll show you why we do it. There's a reason for everything we do in this particular discipline. And uh, the size of the saddle horn, the diameter is too big to grab a hold of if things fall apart. So. I like this style of holding a rope on because I can grab my lariat a lot easier than I can grab my saddle horn. And I've noticed over the years, no matter what the size, if people have grabbed a saddle horn and the horse bucks hard enough, they'll break their wrist. So there's three wraps going towards the cannon. That makes four to go around the saddle horn and back to the buckle on the other side. Okay, so now we'll come over here and do the buckle. So your buckle comes out on this side and there's, that's why it is because you've got the, the strength of this strap going across here. Now let's go back over the other side. But what we do is we grab the rope here when we're going down a steep hill or horse blows up you can it'll give you I don't know extra half a jump before you get dumped anyway but you grab that instead of the saddle horn I grab this all the time I've got a habit of holding it not because I'm scared to death but it's just a habit so after if you were doing wheat pastures under pivots in Amarillo you wouldn't bother with any of this you'd have a piece of rubber or bungee you hook it over the horn and you'd go because you're roping like bam, bam, bam. That's what they do. All right, us, we work by the month, so it takes us a while to get everything in order, which I don't care. But Now, I made a wrap on this. This is a, a colt deal for you guys that ride colts. I did this so I could keep my rope closer to my saddle and 
I can grab it if things start to fall apart once again. When I grab my rope here, I've got the stability of the horn and the strength of the saddle string. And that's helped me a lot of times because the horse's crater in the front, like guys that ride outside will, will tell you their horse will trip and start to go down the front end. You just grab this rope and lean back and it'll help you. And this keeps your rope hard against your leg and not flopping around. Okay, the California style is to have the loop ready to build. Well, if I was on the feed ground or doing a lot of doctrine in the corral, that's exactly what I'd have on there. But when I'm riding outside, I make this the same size simply out of practicality. I don't want it hanging up on anything. Just the fact of this doing this is enough for me to be worried about sticking a branch in it. So that's how the Oregon style rope strap works and in the Oregon style this isn't part of it and we're not going to call it the pat style we're just going to say this is something else I do to add for a little more insurance which reminds me if somebody you know we get a lot of emails everybody knows that now and I'm I love it but somebody watched a video we made of doctrine and he made the comment it was the most boring thing you ever saw. Well, I'm kind of proud of that. So if you, if you want Razzle Dazzle, there's, there's all kinds of people on YouTube now. But if you want to watch a turtle die, just watch how I doctor. And you'll see how it's done. But that's it. Are you still filming? Uh -huh. That's the sound you hear once a horse gets over the novelty of a cricket. So he's had it in his mouth 10, 15 minutes, and that's where he's at now. <laughs> so I like it personally. I'm used to crickets. I like to hear a crow full of crickets. That's pretty darn nice to hear because you know you're riding with some pretty good hands. And the nervous anxiety thing about the cricket, that's just one of the reasons why the bit's designed the way it's designed. That's, that helps calm a horse down and relax. But remember, the reason for this bit is about the concept of release. Right. Time. Stay right there. Now folks, the final question was somebody was asking about a spur counter. Now this vulgar display of wealth belongs to my bride. And what you're gonna see is that this is a spur counter. The bit is made the boot is made for the bit, the excuse me, the spur to sit on the ledge. We have a strap underneath that's real light leather that will in fact break. That is what they don't put on boots anymore. I mean they do, but you got to go to Alpine, Texas or somewhere where there's people that actually work on ranches a lot and you'll find some boots in a small section that have a spur counter. All the rest are... And the bottom is leather. That's a leather sole. It's not a four-ply neoprene. And most of us, what we do is when we get off our horse, we take our boots off and put on our farmer's shoes and go to the house. That's kind of how it works. And it, it's just a habit. And Dwayne Combs over in Nevada, he had a recliner in his saddle house. He could sit down and take his boots off. He had a boot jack and he had his shoes there. Oh, he's got a kick out of that. He was kind of high-end anyway. Anyway, that's why these stirrup, the spurs stay where they belong when you do it right with the correct boot. Thank you. Yep. Now keep video. We watch him take this bit. That's a pretty 
tiny bit. This is Deb's new head stall I made her. And she didn't want no buckle near the eye. Pulled her to play well. She earned every piece of this bridle. She wanted to buckle here instead of here. And I get it. Well, if you're got an anvil headed horse like Chinaco, you're gonna have to have a lot of leather, but a regular horse like this, you can get away with a short tab off the end. And it's basically custom made for this horse. But I've always, I've always tried real hard which I haven't one, had one that didn't do it yet over time was to present a bit to a horse and have him reach down and take it. I think that's a polite way to put a bit on a horse and to take it off you let them spit it out. Okay folks now once again there's your way, my way, the highway, all those funny little sayings you hear. This horse doesn't have a Lamal rein. Yet. Yet. He's going, he's going to have a rawhide Ramal rain when this is over. Once again, he's, was he seven? Yeah. Come out of Mexico and he's getting transitioned into riding off of your leg. Okay, I don't want him to do the bank robber thing on the B Westerns. I want him to keep his head quiet and down. So we will use a split rein on him until I can transition to a straight up rein or Deb can. What we're doing is she he's coming seven, so she's got a long time to work with him. Let me lead him ahead a little bit and show you why. And uh, to me, this is that thing about don't be afraid to take your time. So this is the new bit. You know, watch what his skull does. You see my right hand. Now I'm gonna ask him to walk backwards. There, he's gonna search for the release. And that made the foot move. Now watch his ears, they moved. He's already, he's fine with it. I always got a kick out when I saw Tom Dorrance's wife get on from the door of the tack room of the trailer. I always thought that was pretty cool. The Dorrance family are like a national treasure and I don't mean just Tom and Bill. That whole dang outfit, they're just a bunch of really good people. And they did what they did for the right reasons. Let me walk around a little bit. I've got my left leg on him. Now I'm going to make contact. Keep him walking. Now folks, we've been through this before, but I want to show you something. Here I am. 
He's getting used to the bit. Look right between his ears. Stay up there, Dad. And you watch the width of my hand is about the same as his mouth. And that's why I ride in a flat hand. And that's why the Ramal rein comes later for me transitioning a horse to a western bit. I've been over this before, but evidently I need to mention it again. If I was to try to teach him everything this way, I would waste my time and he would be slinging his head more because I have to do more of this. If I can leave my hand flat, and if I'll get right between his ears, I'll show you. I can make my hand do this. That's why I ride with a flat hand. Now, I'm going to pick up my hand. It's on the neck. That's neutral. I just picked it up. I sit up and I asked him to walk backwards. Now, he's watching him work it out. I'm going to leave my hand. I hope you can see it. Now I'm going to lean back, my legs are off, he's working out his options. Option, release. Alright, that's a brand new bit. That's a way to, to, inter, to um, introduce it, I think. Now remember, he's been riding a slicer. He's been riding a curb bit. He was riding Mexico in a curb bit. This is a different bit. You know, we all can hear all the bit stories, but it only takes minutes if you'll present this correctly. Now I'm going to ask him again. I need you to walk backwards. Now. Options, thinking, processing, made it. All the pretty stuff is going to come out the other side later. Right now, I need my body to come out the bottom of his feet. It's irrelevant about his head. I'm going to show you again. Now, he's, I'm going to present my skeleton, and he is going to move off of my skeleton, which means it's going to come out the bottom of his feet. Right? Now. There it is. That's my point. He did that intentionally without me pulling on the bit and the reins. Okay, so now the stuff you're seeing now is the busy part of a horse getting comfortable with a bit. Which moving right along, I think you can appreciate why I hung a spade on Chinaco riding outside and let him get comfortable with it without me having anything to do with it. Now he in fact understands what I want. So as I touch the reins, and as I raise my hand, I will put a dish in my spine, take my legs off, lean back, and exhale. I can feel his skeleton loading up. This is just an exercise there. That's how it starts. That's why I ride in a flat hand split reins. Thank you.